Okay, so fair warning, my dogs were just barking while I was uploading the last video. So if you hear barking, it's just them. Okay, so the usefulness of the selection process. Um, so utility is another word for usefulness. And uh, utility refers to whether it achieves the goals, right? And then also whether it's cost effective and worth doing. And factors that go into determining whether the selection process that you're thinking about um, following is useful or not is the decision accuracy, the validity of the, of the items, um, the predictors, and then the base rate of um, the characteristics in the population, and then selection ratio. Okay, let's address those one by one. All right, decision accuracy. Okay, I kind of relabeled this a little bit from our textbook because I thought it was very strange that they didn't just go ahead and put the Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 on the chart. So I did that. Okay, so um, this kind of goes back to what I was kind of gesturing to you guys about in the last segment about you've got the predictor battery along the x-axis on the bottom. You've got the criterion scores along the y-axis um, on the left. Okay. And then what, what we've done in this um, chart is we've pretty much divided the predictor, predictor battery into having a cutoff so that you've got anybody who's below the score will be rejected, anybody who's above the score will be hired. And then on the criterion, we've determined what, it, what constitutes success on the job, right? And if you're below a certain cutoff, we call that failure on the job. If you're above that cutoff, we call that success. Okay, now by dividing the... Um, X and Y axis into these two, you know, these these reject higher, failure success kinds of things, we end up with the four quadrants. So if we look at quadrant one in the upper right hand corner, those are the um, times that we've hired the person and they've been successful on the job. The analogy to that would be quadrant two, which is in the lower left, which is where we didn't hire the part of the applicant and um, they would have presumably been under the criterion level. Um, they would have been a failure on the job, um, which that would have to be sort of hypothetical. Any of these rejects would have to be sort of hypothetical because we don't have follow-up data on them because we didn't hire them, right? Um, but presumably. Okay, then we have in quadrant three, those people who we hired, and then they were failures on the job. They did not perform as well as their predictors implied they should have. And then in quadrant four, we've got the people who we did not hire who would have been successful. Where this would be an example where the predictor battery failed us because we should have hired them. They would have been great on the job, but we didn't hire them. Okay, so those are the four, the four quadrants. Now, if you think about it, the names for the four quadrants really make sense because quadrant one is called a hit. Uh, those are the, the times where we hired people who ended up being successes. That's a hit. Quadrant two is called correct rejections because they would have been failures and we rejected them. Quadrant three is called a false alarm. We thought they were going to be good, but they didn't meet up to our um, on-the-job criteria. So that's called, we thought it was going to work and it didn't, that's a false alarm. Quadrant four is called a miss. We had an opportunity to hire a good candidate who would have been successful on the job, but the, the predictor battery missed their skill set and misrepresented them. Okay, so we've got our hits, our misses, our correct rejections, and our false alarms. Okay. Now, Decision accuracy is when you take the participants or the applicants who fall into quadrant one and divide that by those who fall into the sum of quadrant one and quadrant three. So basically, all you take the people who you hired and were successful and then divide it by all the total number of people who you hired. So that gives us a little insight into the decision accuracy, right? Like if I hired 10 people and eight of them were successful on the job, then I've got 80% decision accuracy, right? So that makes pretty decent sense. Overall decision accuracy is taking into consideration all the applicants that were there. And so we're gonna look at accurate decisions would be anything in quadrant one and two, because you correctly rejected people who probably would have failed on the job. You correctly hired people who were successful on the job. So we sum those two quadrants up, and that becomes our numerator. And then you divide by the total number of applicants, those who fell into any of the four quadrants. And so that gives us some insight into um, overall how accurate was this 
um, predictor battery in rejecting or, or hiring the appropriate person. The goal is to maximize the number of people who are in quadrants one and two, where we're hiring people who end up being su successful on the job and rejecting people who would have been failures on the job, and to minimize the misses and the falses, false alarms. Um, so our, our goal is to have good decision accuracy that causes us to hire people who will be successful and to be able to detect people who would be successful accurately so we don't inadvertently um, fail to hire somebody who would have been really a, a good match. Um, and we want to maximize correct rejections and minimize you know, those false alarms where we think they're going to do well and they end up not doing well. So we want lots of quadrant ones and twos and um, minimal quadrant three and four. And so the way that this little obelisk or whatever this is called, oblong oval, is drawn is sort of that advantageous kind of ratio where most of the um, decisions are in the quadrant one and two and relatively few are in the, the three and four. All right, so that's decision accuracy. Validity, um, which we've been talking about earlier in earlier segments, is when you maximize the hits and the correct rejections while minimizing the misses and the false alarms. So in this picture, when I mentioned that the goal was to minimize, the, minimize these and maximize those, um, we're talking about the validity. So when we have a good valid instrument, we're going to have a battery that really boosts decision accuracy, really um, improves our chances of, of hits and correct rejections and minimizes our risk of misses and false alarms. Now, base rate refers to the percentage of current employees who are successful on the job. So when we talk about the usefulness of a prediction battery, if we, before we implemented the battery, if we have 80% of our employees operating at the acceptable level, and then after implementing the, the battery, we have 80% of those people hired under the battery, um, being successful on the job, it doesn't seem all that useful. I mean, why'd we bother if what we were doing beforehand was working just as well as what we're doing now that we have the predictor? Um, so generally, we want to find out how many people who were hired in the old routine have been considered su successful compared to um, what this predictor is able to do, what this battery is able to do for us. Um, selection ratio refers to the number of job openings that we have divided by the total number of applicants. The smaller the ratio, the greater the potential utility of the selection battery. Um, what we're talking about with a smaller ratio, if you have one job and two applicants, uh, your selection battery probably isn't going to really matter. If you have to pick one of those two people, it's sort of like, well, I guess we'll just pick one. I mean, it really doesn't matter. If you have a smaller ratio where you have one job and 20 applicants for the job, all of a sudden a battery might make good sense because you've got all these people, all this interest, and you've got to figure out among all these people, how am I going to figure out who's the best match? Um, so the smaller the ratio, the greater the, the potential that this battery may really help you to sort through the applicants. Um, this really emphasizes how important recruitment is, you know, as we were talking about in the earlier segment. You know, if you can get more applicants, then you have a better chance of finding a good match, right? You're, the organization has more options for, you know, applicants. It's, uh, it's really tough if you put out a job opening and very few people apply, you're sort of stuck with whoever applies, especially if you need to fill it now. Um, sometimes uh, companies will go ahead and delay hiring until they can get a bigger uh, applicant pool because they want to have choices. They want to have um, more options available to them to let their battery work you know, so that they really can choose among the options. The last issue about utility is that cost effectiveness, right? Um, is it worth it? Um, if it, if the revenue from hiring better employees um, doesn't compensate for the costs of developing and implementing the battery, you might not perceive it as worthwhile, right? If, Ideally, you want to have um, ideally you want to have a better cost benefits analysis, right? You want um, the revenue that 
is generated by having better employees to sort of balance out with the cost that it takes to recruit and select those better employees, then it feels like it's worth it, right? But if you're putting all this energy into um, developing a battery and you're getting the same basic kind of part, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm such a researcher, I keep forgetting their employees. Um, if you keep getting the same basic kind of employees, uh, it just doesn't seem like it's worth the energy to generate this battery. So uh, if you can get a balance between how much it costs to generate the battery and then how much better employees you're getting, then uh, it's totally worth it to develop a selection battery. All right, let's go ahead and take a break here so we can change gears and talk about legal issues in the next segment. <laughs> 